Good afternoon, everyone. I am Jeremy Labbé, Research Fellow on Humanitarian Affairs at IPI, and I am happy to welcome you to this discussion with Mr. Abdou Dieng, who was appointed Senior Humanitarian Coordinator for the Central African Republic from December 2013 to April 2014 as part of the declaration of a level three emergency in that country by the Interagency Standing Committee. For those who are not familiar with this concept of level three emergency, this is certainly this is something that we will discuss uh, today. It is indeed a great opportunity for some sort of debriefing with you all on the humanitarian situation in Central African Republic now that Mr. Dieng has left his position and has had time to reflect on what was certainly a very challenging and intensive four-month mission. This event today is the latest of IPI's Humanitarian Affairs series, which a number of you are familiar with that offers a platform to humanitarian coordinators and other senior humanitarian practitioners to meet with the humanitarian and diplomatic community in New York. This series aims to provide a first, first-hand information to members of the UN dipl diplomatic community on the reality of contemporary humanitarian crises and by extension to discuss some of the greatest humanitarian challenges facing humanitarian action today. This series has so far featured humanitarian coordinators for Somalia, uh, from Sudan, for the Sahel region, and for Afghanistan, as well as, on two occasions, the successive regional refugee coordinators for Syria. It is therefore with great pleasure that we welcome today Abdou Dieng to hear his perspectives on the priorities and the challenges to responding to the deteriorating humanitarian situation in the Central African Republic, which is first and foremost a severe protection crisis. As you all know, the situation has sharply deteriorated in the country since the coup d'etat of March 2013 by a coalition of rebel groups known as Silica. And since then, and particularly since December 2013, the country has descended into chaos and increased interconfessional violence between Christian and Muslim communities. This prompted various officials to warn of a possible genocide as Christian anti-Balaka militia um, have stepped up attacks against the Muslim community because of their suspected affiliation with the ex Selika uh, rebels. It is in this context that the Interagency Standing Committee, an interagency platform involving key UN and non-UN humanitarian organizations, has declared a level three emergency in the country that resulted, amongst other measures, in the appointment of Abdou Dieng as a senior humanitarian coordinator for initially three month mission um, aimed at stepping up the humanitarian response in the country. Today, the UN estimates that 2.5 million people out of a population of 4.6 million, so more than half of the population of the country, are in need of assistance. The crisis has pushed more than 900,000 people to flee either within or outside of the country, including more than 350,000 who sought refuge in neighboring countries. In addition, just before leaving his position in April, Mr. Dieng was warning that the situation was expected to further deteriorate with the, the arrival of the lean and rainy seasons. Meanwhile, meanwhile, killings and violence continue unabated, prompting humanitarian agencies with the support of the French Sangaris forces and peacekeepers present in the country to facilitate the relocation of entire Muslim communities out of arms way. This triggered a debate on the appropriateness of what some referred to as a, a process of ethnic cleansing that would be somehow um, facilitated by the international community, which might result in the de facto partition of the country and might also complicate, according to, uh, to some, might complicate efforts at national reconciliation. It remains that such relocation seems the only way at this stage to save the lives of these communities who are subject to recurrent attacks by anti-Balaka militia. And violence increasingly impacts humanitarian actors too. 
with more than 12 aid workers killed since last September, including staff from Médecins Sans Frontières and the UN High Commissioner for Refugees in recent weeks. So these are some of the challenges that Abdou Dieng will discuss today. Mr. Mr. Dieng, who's a Senegalese national, has more than 20 years experience in emergency response with the World Food Programme, including as country representative in Ethiopia, the Democratic Republic of Congo, Guinea, Côte d'Ivoire, and Guinea-Bissau. And we were discussing just before the event, and I, I understood that uh, Mr. Abdou Dieng now, who has, uh, who has finished um, his position as senior humanitarian coordinator in Central African Republic, will resume his, his position as country representative of the WFP for Ethiopia. And you can find more information in his biography, which is included in your papers. So with this brief introduction, I would like now to give the floor to Abdou Dieng for a 15 to 20 minutes presentation before opening the floor uh, for a Q&A session with our participants. So Abdou, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, first of all, I'm really privileged to be here with you today uh, to have a discussion on not only the humanitarian situation in Central Africa Republic, but we will certainly touch on other aspects of the crisis. I will not make a, a lecture. I think Jeremy has described the context uh, very well. Most of the issue that I wanted to raise within the context, you already raised them. I would like this session to be open, direct, uh, interactive, and uh, since I'm on my way out, I will be more than frank to discuss with you. Just to, to add a few points on what has been said so far. The, the crisis in Central Africa Republic started decades ago. It just uh, took another dimension starting end of 2013, when the Antibalaka attack both the town of Bangui and Bosango. But over the last decade, everybody knew that this country was falling apart, and today, uh, I even could not say that this is a state as per se. You have a country where 2.5 million people out of 4.5 required assistance. You have a country where the civil servants are not paid since months and months. The whole health system is run by the international community, particularly the NGOs. The kids are not going to school. People hardly have uh, the possibility to, to, to meet their basic need, which are food, water, health. Most of the population either displaced or refugees. 600,000 people today still remain displaced in their own country. A huge number, talk about maybe 200,000 in Bangui. And within Bangui, there is one site which is known to you, I'm sure, for those who watch TVs uh, that we call Mpoko, which is at the airport where you still have 50,000 people gathered there. 300,000 people are, have seek refuge in neighboring countries, Cameroon, Chad, uh, DR Congo, Republic of Congo. So you can see that the situation is still complicated. But it's not only uh, humanitarian. The, the, the crisis has several dimensions. There is it's a political one. It's a security one, humanitarian, and now touching into economic one. In the meantime, you have different armed groups, those who are 
known mainly by you are the antibalaka and the seleka or ex seleka, depend on how we call them. Committing violence every day and people being killed at high scale, which has created a huge protection crisis. I was telling to people yesterday in Geneva that if you ask me the main challenge in Central Africa, I will say number one, protection, number two, protection, number three, protection. Protection of civilians is extremely uh, uh, high on the agenda. In the meantime, you have international forces in the country, including MISCA, which is an African Union forces, about 10,000 people. You have the French, Sangari, about 2,000 people. Today, you have the Air Force, European. We expect that they will deploy about 1,000 people. And maybe later on, all this together being taken over by the United Nations under MINUSCA. But that will take some time. And still, yet, difficult to control those groups. At the very beginning, we were seeing Central African civilians being targeted, depend on where you are. Uh, they, you have to remember that when the Seleka came to power, they committed lots of atrocities, but that was a year ago. Now, the anti-Balaka has shaped and are committing lots of atrocities. Uh, there are some risks of this country being divided into minimum two, because in the meantime, we're seeing different groups. And a bit worrisome, the last couple of weeks, we're seeing lots of humanitarian being killed. And this week, journalists, French journalists killed, which uh, tell us how severe the, the, the situation is. And the only hope that we have to, to control the situation is the deployment of the Blue Helmets, uh, DPKO, which we don't believe will happen uh, soon. From now on till September, which is, uh, uh, we believe the PKO will deploy, we have a vacuum. We need to protect civilians. We need to provide assistance in a context which is becoming more and more dangerous. In a context of what we call rainy season, with very poor uh, road infrastructure, Everything is, will be much more complicated than before from now on till September, which correspond to what we call lean season. Even if there were no crisis in that country, uh, like in many African countries, during the lean season, which is the time that people, they go, to their, they go for um, planting. Uh, this is a time when they have exhausted all their resources waiting for the next harvest to come. That is also a big challenge. <clears throat> so in front of the international forces, even if the number is increasing or we are trying to see how to strengthen MISCA until the arrival of the PKO, forces yet, but Without the logistic support which is required, it will become extremely difficult. Even now, the MISCA has very, very limited capacity in terms of logistics, particularly air asset. And without that, access to various parts of the country will be extremely difficult. <clears throat> he mentioned it. Uh, we had to face a situation which I'm sure we will discuss where uh, we used to talk a lot about saving life. Uh, but when we used to talk about saving life in humanitarian setting, it was about providing food to people so that they do not die, or providing health or water. 
but provide a, a saving life in a context of Central Africa is just preventing people to be massacred, to be killed. It was a huge dilemma from, for all of us, the entire humanitarian community, to move minorities who were at risk of being killed to move them elsewhere. Those people, representing about, when I left, 20,000 people, they only have two choices. One is to stay where they are and killed. The second is to be moved, maybe within their own country, which they have the right to do so, with the support of the international community. Everybody was not in agreement. Most of us agreed that that was the approach. They were, for political reason, few who think that by moving those people in area where they choose, not us, uh, which most likely being close to their relative, meaning east and north, with the consent of the host population and with the support of the international forces. That has led us to see a town called Basangoa. I'm sure many of you travel to Bangui. Today, emptied of part of its population, the Muslim. No more Muslim in Bas Basangoa, where you know there was a big number. The other part was within Bangui, an area called PK-12, emptied about, from the Muslim who were living there. We only have now two areas in the south where you can see Muslim population. One is PK-5, another one a town called Boda. And in those two locations, protection is still a big issue and they're asking to move, but we don't have the solution for the time being. So I will not take too much of time in, uh, in this part, but again, extremely open to, to discuss. Just maybe to say that within the context of what we call the L3, which is the highest level in terms of the international community assessing the situation of a country, uh, Central Africa was declared L3, like in South Sudan or in Syria. These are the three countries today uh, being managed under L3. One was Philippines, but disactivated after three months. What we have observed is that, and if you remember, in December, the international community was highly criticized for, for not doing enough in Central African Republic, which was true. Since then, the entire international community, including UN and NGOs, have scaled up highly in terms of human resources. But uh, that was the, the, the framework of the, the, the three months L3, which is now extended for another six months, which we have to continue supporting. And even beyond, because this crisis just started, so a lot has been done, but a lot uh, need to be done. So stop here and try to answer your question. Thank you very much, uh, Abdu. Maybe before um, opening the floor, uh, I would like to ask you um, a couple of questions. Um, and one precisely on this level three emergency. Um, I don't want that we get too much into the, the, the nitty gritty of um, uh, procedural aspects of the, of the L3. Uh, but could you tell us a little bit more about what such a declaration entails in terms of measures um, taken uh, besides the, your appointment, because you are uh, appointed, but w w what does it mean concretely? What implications does it have? What, what are the measures taken? And may maybe the, the early lessons learned from, uh, from this exercise, if any. So this is my first question, then I will, uh, I will come back to you with a, a second one. Yeah, uh, thank you. I think the L3 declaration is part of the transformative agenda protocol. <clears throat> 
uh, I was not part of those who worked on the uh, transformative agenda, but in the case of Central Africa Republic, I think this was the right thing to do. Uh, December, the response uh, the, the, the was extremely low for many reasons. But collectively, decisions were taken to follow uh, the uh, transformative agenda protocol. I will not get into the detail because what it is is strengthening the leadership and the coordination. And when I say that, when we talk about leadership and coordination, it's not at the individual level, it's, a, it's, it's something collective. Because although you have a senior humanitarian coordinator, but the decision body within that framework is what we call the XCT, which is a humanitarian country team, where all the UN are part of it, and also the NGOs and the donors. And this is where we make the decision. But you have to go through a certain number of uh, protocol, meaning you need to know exactly what the needs are. And I'm telling you, in a context of Central African Republic in December, it was extremely difficult to assess what the needs were. Prior to the L3 declaration, the, the, the estimation of the need was about $100 million altogether for all agency. Right in January, when we did what we call the MIRA, we come up with $500 million, which led to a, a, a plan that we call S SRP. That has taken us to have a kind of a donor conference in Brussels in January. And the, 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 the frustration of the international community is that when we met in Brussels, there were a kind of commitment from the donors to fund the plan. 500 million. As I speak today, it is about 30% funded, which also have a huge impact on what we do. Now, just to, to, to complete on that, uh, all agencies, all humanitarian communities has made a lots of effort to do what we call search, bringing additional staff in the country, uh, which mean uh, additional resources to do the job, to respond at scale. That has been done, and without, I have been in many other emergency during the last uh, couple of years when this did not exist, but this has helped us a lot. And then there, there, were, there were many other aspects, uh, 100 day plan, uh, uh, peer review coming to uh, come and check what was supposed to be done, what was done, what was not done. But I think uh, for those who work on transformative agenda, this is something which has proven to be extremely positive because it pushed all of us to make extra effort to respond to needs with the scale was uh, beyond the capacity of everybody. I'm not saying that after three months, uh, everything has been done, a lot has been done, but much more uh, need to be done in the next couple of months. Thank you very much for this clarification. And then my, my, second, my second question before really opening the floor is about the, the relocation of uh, Muslim minorities. I was just wondering whether I mean, in, in people's mind, people who are concerned and who were relocated in the, in the north or in the, the east of the country, as you described, uh, do you think they, they see themselves as coming back in the future to to Bangui or Bosangoa or wherever they, they are from? Uh, or do you feel that it might indeed create uh, some kind of um, demographic redistribution within the, the country? What's, what's uh, the mindset about uh, on, on this? All the people who left their location and went elsewhere, either within the country or outside the country, their aim is to come back to their own country when securities will allow it. And even beyond that, I am advocating that they must come back when security will be 
restored and participate even to the election. It should be a conditionality for the international community that these people, we talk about millions of people who left must be part of the election process. Otherwise, no elections. Maybe those who have a, a, a political agenda will not agree with me, but if we make or take the risk of having election as scheduled as it is in February next year and excluding a huge part of the population, those elections will be contested. And you know, it's not because you have an election that the problem are resolved. The election must be inclusive. Everybody should participate. Otherwise, it becomes a big issue. Yes, uh, people must come back, and they want to come back. All those who left, they were forced to, to leave. I was talking about only two part of the South hosting uh, Muslim community, meaning PK5 and Boda, they don't want to go. But they are forced. Uh, those who are in Bosangoa, they stayed there months. But at the end, it was uh, not sustainable for them to stay, and they left. But they want to come back, and they have to come back, get uh, back their assets, and uh, make their life, because these are Central Africans. Thank you. So now let's open the floor to the participants. There are a few rules that I would like to, to remind you of. Uh, please, first, when you um, take the, the floor, uh, mention your name and affiliation. I would also appreciate if you can stand up. Um, and then keep the microphone steady, please, in front of your mouth, because uh, to, to hear you, but also because this event is webcasted, as you can see. And if we want people on the other side of the screen to, to hear your question, it needs to be uh, recorded properly. So please keep the microphone steady. And finally, try to keep your questions uh, quite straight to the point and relatively short. Thank you very much. I, I will take uh, two to three questions at a time, if it's fine with you. And then uh, we'll, so we'll have several rounds of questions. So OK, I see a first question here, William Verdon. Uh, thank you, William Verdone, African Views Organization. Uh, sir, you touched upon, you touched upon uh, a lot of things that seem to have come to a dead end. Uh, healthcare and, and security and, and uh, finance and probably employment. What about education? Would you speak a little bit about that? Thank you. And there is a second question, the lady there. And there will be a third question, this gentleman standing at the back. Thank you. My name is Hilda Klemetsdahl from the Mission of Norway. Um, thank you very much for your presentation. I have a couple of questions. You talked about uh, food insecurity, and I wonder um, to what extent when you work on food assistance, uh, how do you work with local producers, local markets, in terms of building resilience for the for the farmers and for the local communities? And and also, um, when there are reports about uh, ethnic conflicts like this, um, what to what extent is the sexual violence being documented, and and um, what type of services do they have access to? Thank you. So there is. Uh, oh, yes. Thank you. My name is Alan Sackler from the Department of Peace and Operations. Uh, can I ask you to speak up a, a oh, little bit because uh, yes. we have difficulties sure, to hear sure. you here. Sorry. Thank you. My name is uh, Alan Sackler from DPKO. I'm working on um, uh, in particular Congo and, and other countries in the region. My question would be, what, how important would you assess the establishment of a sound financial governance system, governance system. Uh, given the fact that we have a country which is bankrupt, basically, where uh, and there would be a need to uh, reestablish some semblance of a uh, different structure, say through uh, establishment of a central bank and uh, maybe other issues, to, to allow the government to again have a financial fluidity to address some of the core tasks which attend. Thank you. 
Abdul, uh, Abdul Thank back you. to you. Uh, the first question was on education. I'm glad that uh, I thought I touched on it. Maybe I forgot I was talking in different forum or fora today. And this is the main, main issue that this country is struggling with. Kids are not going to school since many years. And the result of all what you have seen today come from lack of education. You have about 700,000 kids out of school. And if you look at our appeal, I'm, 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 I'm glad that you go and look at what we call the SRP, where you have the different sectors out of those 500 million that I talk about. The less funded sector is education. It's a huge issue. Of course, this is something that the government has to take care of. No, it's very difficult for partners to run the education of a country. But they are not doing it. They will not be able to do it. And until this issue is addressed, this country will be facing the problem, the type of problem they are facing. That is definitely clear. I know that UNICEF has a big plan. But this, when, when we talk to them and they talk about sovereignty of, their, of this country, I said, this is exactly the responsibility that you have to bear. Until you are not able to protect your people, educate your children, you don't tell us about sovereignty. This is, it's, it's, you have a responsibility and also uh, 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 accountability. Now, food security, the other question. Uh, if you look at this crisis, the response, uh, we have spoken the last months less about food compared to other sectors. The reason is those who are displaced or, or, or those affected by the crisis, the, the first months, were mainly in urban setting like Bangi. If you take the, ca the camp, which is at the airport, Poco, where there were 100,000 people, most of them are urban people. They have a job during the day. They rely on something. They can go do something, have very little here and there, and take care of their. It's very, very different uh, from those who are displaced in, in rural areas. However, that was the first month. But in the rural area, most of the population, they relied on food security. And most of them were either displaced or hiding, uh, hiding in the bush. One of the, the, the biggest effort which was made in Bangui was to make sure we get resources to provide most of the population with seeds and input for them not to miss the agriculture season, which is coming now. Not entirely, but at least if half of their need are covered, that could be fine within that context. Otherwise, we will pay, the international community next year will pay it, uh, expensively because people will rely entirely on, 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 on food. This is why FAO has a big program supported by the World Bank uh, to help these people to get some seeds and at least take care of part of their of their needs. Sexual violence, yes, is 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 also among the issues. Violence in general and sexual violence. Uh, those agency mandated and part of our 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 part of our job collectively, I think within the the, 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 the framework of the L3 is uh, this accountability to the population. And within the accountability to the population, so they know what they write, and there is a big part which is related to sexual violence, and we're trying to address those depending on who does what, and we hope that with MINUSCA uh, coming in, uh, effort, greater effort will be made to prevent uh, those issues. The other, the, the last one was on, on financial governance. 
Yes, this country doesn't have, for the time being, any revenue. Any revenue. Salaries were paid. The first salaries were paid by uh, government of neighboring countries, Congo, Cameroon. They give them something. Now the World Bank is jumping in, except for the militaries. I think European Union will do something. But a country cannot rely on paying salaries every month counting on uh, external help. What is being done is at least to make sure that uh, tax and duties are paid on uh, imported products. And the only way to, 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 to tackle that issue is on the corridor between everything come from Cameroon entering into the country. I know that there are many partners supporting the government through the Ministry of Finance to make sure at least the government can collect few revenue and those revenue being used to uh, address issue related to development. And to do that, uh, because the civil servants are not paid, because the infrastructure are extremely poor, there are many partners now seconding staff to the government for them to help them to do it. I know that France is uh, through uh, uh, IFD is trying to do a lot in but it will be very limited amount of money compared to what is required to cover the need for paying salaries, uh, putting kids to school, uh, making sure that health centers are functioning. Uh, but at least it's, it's a step, because for the time being, uh, the government is not collecting revenue to uh, address issues that they should do. Are there any other questions in the room? I'm sure there are. Yes, last row there, we have one question. Yes, thank you, Jeremy. I'm Javier Gasol from the Spanish Mission. <coughs> uh, thank you very much for, the, uh, for your words. Uh, you've mentioned that this is mainly and um, basically a protection crisis and that security concerns are probably the most urgent to be, to be met. Uh, I would have two questions in this respect. One, uh, you said that uh, humanitarian actors are being uh, victims of, uh, of violence. Uh, do you mean they are being victims as anybody else or they are specifically targeted? And in that respect, uh, to what extent uh, maybe you could, you could tell us a bit on the relationship between the humanitarian coordinator and the, the humanitarian actors and the different missions that are uh, working on the field, both uh, the French Sangaris and MISCA, and what's the role that you expect from, uh, from MINUSCA when it is uh, put in place and uh, from the European uh, forces that are going to be deployed as well. Thank you. Uh, is there any other question? Yes, Udo, right here on the second row. Only if there's no, no other question, but you touched on uh, a particular issue up to that I wanted to follow up on. Udo, may I ask you Udo, to... Uh, Udo Jans from UNHCR here thank in, you. in New York. Uh, the evacuation of people is never an easy decision to make. Um, for many of us, from all we have read and heard, uh, Bangi is probably the epitome of being caught between a rock and a hard place, and you have volunteered to do that, so you have the respect from all of us in the room, I'm sure. Um, this was a tough assignment. Uh, the, the pictures of Mboko at the airport and the dilemma of what to do to, on the one hand, allow flight security, basic security, but at the same time, move people to uh, a, a, another place where they are secure, clearly must have been uh, major challenges. I had the impression that there was a big divide within the mission and the country team on the virtues of evacuating or relocating people when it is needed. I would love to hear a little bit more about that, because if we are divided on that question, then it's not surprising that ultimately the government makes a public communique distancing itself from 
the evacuations. And perhaps you could say a word on that one too, because one minute we heard the Prime Minister had indeed approved the evacuation of 1,250 people, and the next day we had a protest letter or a communique from the government denying it. That would be very helpful. Thank you. If there are no other question right now, I might add my own. Oh, I saw a hand being raised there, but maybe uh, we'll come back to you, Maureen, if you, if you don't take mind. Two and then we come back. Sure, okay. sure. Let's do that. Let, let me uh, start with the, the last question. If you asking me that there was a, a kind of division within the humanitarian community, whether agreeing on uh, 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 relocation or not, they were not. There were division within the broader, let's say, international community. To be frank with you, the only uh, uh, opposition was a French. They were not in agreement at the beginning with that. But within the humanitarian community, there were no, well, maybe there were a few who, was, who were more of, we don't have an opinion. I consulted everybody, including ICRC. We were all in agreement. And you're right. This is the most difficult decision I had been confronted with in my life to relocate people. But I am also glad that to get to that point, uh, to be able to do it, I had a lot of support from our principal, from your organization, because you're leading that cluster. And when we had to make those difficult choice, we had a backup. Of course, we knew. Uh, and from the president, the prime minister, I informed all of them that they are part of the agreement for those who are familiar with the Uganda Convention, which he has worked a lot on. Kampala, sorry, Kampala Agreement. They have ratified that convention, and that gives us, that paves the way for us, seeing that this is part of international law that you have. Of course, still, that is the, 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 the our protection. So there were no disagreement, there was some disagreement, but the government has to do, these are politicians, because they knew that they were part of the population. But right after, a day after, they were telling us, yes, but last resort. She was there uh, the, the next day when they met with the president. But in front of the world, they would say no. Of course, they were not. Perfect. When I met the prime minister, what he was telling me, when you do it, do it without publicity. We never, at the country office, at the country level, uh, uh, made some kind of publicity out of it. It was, it was not. But the media was in, were in the country, and right and this is where, where the issue come from. When we decided to relocate that day from PK-12, the same day the Prime Minister wanted to have a press conference with the media. And all of them called and said, we cannot come because we are going to participate or cover the relocation. This is how he knew about the detail of the agenda. And he called us. But they were informed. They knew about it. Uh, we get the, ba the, 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 the backing. It's not something that we, we want to do, but this is the only option that we were left with. And I hope that we will find other solutions for people to, to stay where they are, in their country. Otherwise, uh, this is what they ask for. It's not us telling them, you are going to be relocated. <laughs> we are not the one telling them where they will go. All this comes from them, and with the support of the international community. Uh, the other one was about protection security. And the, the relationship, I think, with uh, Sangaris and with other military okay. forces present. Frankly speaking, present. okay, let me start with that. If there is an area where there is a lot which has been done and achieved is in the area of civil-military coordination in Bangui. 
quickly, we have a very good civil military coordination working with MISCA, Sangari, Erfor, tomorrow, even if the FACA come, there is a kind of interaction on a daily basis with the international force, and that worked perfectly well. And I must pay a tribute for those uh, who are doing civil military coordination. But the question which was raised is about, let's say, security of the staff, because now we see humanitarian being killed. You know, we took a lot of risk in Bangui. Remember that in, in Central Africa, during uh, uh, the Seleka, when they came to power, there was a big evacuation, badly done, and people just kept that idea and when I come, I said, it's no longer the time to think about how to leave this country. It's time to think about how to stay. We cannot declare a L3 and talk about evacuation. So we, we took a lot of risk telling UNDSS, you, this is a program criticality. You have to adapt to us rather than telling us you can work here and there. So they took a lot of risk with us. Uh, but what we, what we start seeing the last couple of weeks, whether MSF staff being killed, you want to share staff killed, or the NGO staff killed, journalists is being killed. Uh, if we add to that something, I am afraid that things will change. Uh, now, whether they were targeted or not, I'm not saying that uh, what happened in uh, uh, with the MSF staff. In some way, they were targeted. They were, they, were, they, were, they were shooting at all those in an hospital, including them. Uh, they, they were not targeted as, but they targeted as humanitarian, whether national or international. They were in an hospital. So uh, we have to be extremely careful because uh, if we face or the fatalities, uh, the thinking may change, and it will be very bad for uh, this country. And I'm glad that the president, two days ago, called the whole international community acknowledging uh, uh, the, the effort that are being made to support the population and asking them not to leave because, OK, but it's not enough. We need to to be extremely careful about uh, what is happening next. In that respect, I'd like to ask you uh, an additional question in relation to the safety of humanitarian staff, of issues of humanitarian access. I mean, we all know that one thing that is key in order to ensure uh, humanitarian access and to ensure the, the safety of uh, humanitarian actors is to communicate with all the parties to, uh, to such a conflict, to, uh, uh, to explain what our action is about, that it is not uh, to, to support one community in particular, that it is based on the principle of impartiality, that the, 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 the aid goes where the needs are, and so on and so forth. Uh, but in, in a situation like Central African Republic, where we are talking about uh, uh, scattered militia, uh, are there some, uh, I mean, what are the opportunities for engagement, dialogue with armed groups? Are there some leaders that are ident identifiable that you can communicate with? And uh, what are the challenges in that respect? Could you tell us a little bit more on that aspect, please? Yeah, in my capacity of humanitarian coordinator, I had contact with both Seleka and um, Antimalaka. Of course, it's... Uh, Whenever you talk to a group, there is another group claiming that that group is not representative. You have to talk to me. That is that make it a bit more difficult. It's not the case of South Sudan where you have Sal Rakir and yeah, there are two leaders. Here, those the leaders that we suspect are behind it because of their 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 their, their, their responsibility on other things. They are hiding themselves. They don't want to make it clear. But yes, we have to talk to, to the forces uh, who are on the ground, whether they are Balaka, whether, because these are, uh, these are part of the, but how to do it and who should do it. 
when a couple of agencies come to see me, I said it has to be at the ultra level because the more you have different discussion coming from different agencies, they will play with you and you don't have a kind of uniformity. Uh, but I know that when you also have a political mission in the country, which was Binuka, okay, uh, they have their, their, their mandate, their responsibility. I'm sure tomorrow with MINUSCA it will become much more complicated because they believe that this is their mandate, they, have the, they are the one who should do it. But I think as a humanitarian, there are many other NGOs talking to them. It is not something that you, sh you can avoid in a, in a setting like this one. But, you, but don't do it, uh, everybody going to talk to them, otherwise they will play with you. It has to be centralized, go over. This, uh, let's put it coordinated and kept at, you don't publicize it, you keep it at the minimum. Thank you very much. Um, okay, so we have one additional question at the back, Maureen. Um, thank you, Maureen Quinn from IPI. My, my question is, um, I guess it's a two-part or maybe even a three-part question, is to thinking about with your, your message of the focus should be on protection of civilians um, as priority one, two, and three, is there one or two things that you would like to see the, the interim government do to help, uh, in, you know, I would say work towards that objective? How about for neighboring countries, one or two things, and then for the broader international community, particularly un, until the peacekeeping, uh, the larger mission gets there? Thank you. Um, is there any other question in the room? Then I would suggest, Abdul, that you reply to, to this question. Yes. Um, when you mention uh, uh, interim government, uh, I always said a government to, to play such kind of role uh, need to have control on the forces, on the justice, money, and they don't have any of this. The president only has the title of a president. Anybody today, it's not a matter of the profile of the lady, whoever has been appointed today in Bangui to carry out such kind of duty will be faced, will have the same problem. She doesn't have a power, any power. You cannot pay your civil servant, you cannot put your kids uh, to school, you cannot provide food, health, nothing. This is what she is asked to do, and again, and we tell you in five months you are out and you cannot be part of any political process to be something. We have to stop this kind of, uh, um, it, it, it doesn't work. It really doesn't work. She is not empowered. But now uh, you touch also on the on the on the region of a bit the regional dimension. If you look at the story of this country with Chad, Chad is part. You, you cannot ignore Chad to resolve this problem. But for the time being, they are they are trying to get out of it because they have been accused of so, so many things. But what Chad is saying today, which I don't think that is being addressed, when they had the meeting in January in Jamena, when they kick, uh, excuse me uh, for, the, for the terminology, when they asked Jotoja to leave, there were kind of agreement made there in Jamena which was about sharing the power between the two groups, which is not happening and cannot happen. Because right after, it was agreed that the president will come from one group, the prime minister from another group, which was not respected. And this is exactly why Chad is playing the role that they are playing. 
until to push the government or the international community to respect those kind of gentleman agreement, which will be very difficult. We know that in the next coming days, there will be a new government. But the way that government was, was put in place, the president cannot get read, uh, read of, the, of the prime minister, which means on that political side, something needs to be done to try to see uh, what next. But I don't see that happening. Uh, if that could be uh, a way to, to find a solution, otherwise uh, Chad will continue having the attitude that they have. And every single day, they are uh, 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 showing a kind of sign of durcissement. Uh, they're closing their border. They have taken their troops out of the Miska. It is getting more and more complicated at that front. And I think those who are mandated to deal with this political part of it uh, will do something. Well, in the absence of question for the, from the floor, and please do not hesitate to raise your hand if you have questions. I will just use the privilege of the chair and ask you yet another question. Mm -hmm. uh, one that might not be easy to answer, but uh, let's see. Uh, in relation to the, the presence of international and regional forces in the country of this the, 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 this peacekeeping mission that is uh, uh, taking shape, the, the MINUSCA. Uh, you mentioned the fact that the L3 was recondu reconducted for a six-month period. Mm -hmm. uh, there is somebody who took your succession there, a lady called Claire Bourgeois, who is senior humanitarian coordinator, still separate from the MINUSCA that already exists in the, uh, in the field, even though it doesn't have much contingents yet. Uh, but in six months, there will be a discussion about whether or not the position of humanitarian coordinator should be integrated within the MINUSCA, which is uh, an integrated mission. It is there in, uh, in its name. Um, so today, if you had to, to give uh, an advice to whoever within the secretariat will decide in the, in, uh, in the next six months uh, on this aspect, whether or not this function of humanitarian coordinator should be brought within the mission with all the, the issues that it raised in terms of uh, independence. Uh, what's your, what would be your, your advice? How do you see things? My advice is to keep, and I'm glad that they are keeping it separated from the rest of the mission, at least until September. And my advice was at that time, if they have to do it, at least they have to appoint a, even a deputy who is a bit more independent of the rest. Uh, the rest, we will see in September how the situation will evolve, but it's not the time in CAR to lump the two together. Uh, I'm saying that because if you are a deputy to the SRG, you are a resident coordinator, you are a humanitarian coordinator. I may agree that there are contexts where it makes sense, but in the sense of uh, Central Africa Republic, it does not make sense now, uh, because the perception of the people, even myself, I had some time to go and brief the president, the prime minister, explaining what the role of the SRG is, what my role is, and when they brought a deputy to the SRG. It's not easy for the public to understand what it is. And what do you want to achieve? And bearing in mind that in the MINUSCA uh, uh, organigram that we saw, uh, the deputy SRG, the RC, is in charge of the elections. And that make it, uh, in terms of perception, much more complicated, regardless of what you will explain to people tomorrow. And seeing you dealing with election and humanitarian doesn't make any sense. So we need to see, after this critical period, if integration has to be done. But 
I think that for the time being, it's separate. It has to be kept separate if they want to uh, take my advice, uh, unless they have a extra reason to to put them together. Well, this is your last chance, really, to uh, ask a question to Abdu. So seize this opportunity if you have like a burning issue you want to, uh, to raise. If not, I will suggest to, and apparently uh, it is not the case, uh, I will suggest to close this uh, discussion. And uh, I would like really to thank you very much for being with us today and for being so open and so honest about the, the situation in the, in the country, about some of the, the challenges that are being faced by humanitarian actors you know, in the Central African Republic. And we all wish you good luck in your, with your next appointment, which is just going back to what you were doing before so in, uh, in Ethiopia. So thank you very much for being here, and, uh, and good luck. And thank you.